so good afternoon everybody this is uh, Mike Talbot and we're ready to start this afternoon's webinar um, this is about mediation in the housing sector I'm Mike Talbot uh, the founder and CEO of UK mediation and I'll be speaking with you this afternoon for about 35 to 40 minutes and then there'll be a chance for some uh, questions at the end if you'd like or if you have an urge to ask a question or make a comment uh, please do so as we go along. You should have a chat box on your screen. Um, if you can't see the chat box, there's a button near the top of your screen on the right-hand side uh, with the uh, with chat on it, and that will bring up a box into which you can type and send me a message or send a message to anybody else who's here with us this afternoon. Quite a crowd here this afternoon. That's great to see. All here um, to hear from me about mediation in the housing sector. So we have colleagues from... Uh, social housing, we have some colleagues from private housing who I recognise here, and um, we have some friends from the university sector as well. So I'll be talking about mediation in all of those settings this afternoon as we go along. Here we are. So um, my outline for this afternoon is that initially I'd like to talk about some uh, definitions, <coughs> what we're actually talking about when, we, uh, when we're talking about mediation. <coughs> a few misunderstandings about that, so we'll uh, make sure we clear that one up. We'll talk about where mediation fits in with other ways of solving disputes that you might be more familiar with. So where does mediation fit in? Why is it different? Why do we have this thing? And then how it works. I've um, done quite a bit of work on this myself about how mediation works, why, we, why it works, why it's effective, and I'll give you some uh, tips about that. Talk about where it's used, what kind of applications and areas. And I'll give you some examples. I think it's good to illustrate the points by giving you some examples of disputes. So we'll, we'll go into that as well. So here we are. Let's start by talking about a definition of mediation. It's not meditation, contrary to um, quite a, a lot of confused callers that we get. Um, the word is a bit of a problem. It does look like meditation. It has this myth that it's a bit of a soft option or it's something like a form of counselling. Um, but it's very much not. Um, it's very much a serious process. It's a process in which two or more people who are in dispute agree to appoint a neutral third party to get them talking and negotiating. No big surprises there. But just to say that it's two or more people, so it might be three, four, five, eight, ten, twenty people. Um, they have to be in dispute for it to be mediation, and they have to agree to appoint the neutral third party who will call the mediator. So a few important points within there, which is the voluntariness of mediation. It's got to be voluntary participation. Um, it has to be uh, a dispute. So it's not a process of team building or anything like that. It's actually dispute resolution, and it's a form of alternative dispute resolution, or ADR, as we call it. So the mediator who gets appointed this way, uh, the point is that they are impartial, which is a... Easy to say, not so easy to do. Uh, impartiality is a very tricky thing to achieve. It's something that has to be worked on. It's very easy to make judgments in disputes, very easy to come out on one side or the other, and unconsciously or otherwise to make a judgment about who's right and who's wrong. So the impartial side of it is extremely important and kind of tricky to, to manage as well. What we do as mediators is we use a staged process. It's a way of avoiding getting roped into people's disputes. If you have this sort of ordered six or seven stage process that we go through, um, and we can keep order within the process by using this, uh, these stages and steps. Um, and it also helps us to have a bit of a route map through people's conflict, avoids you getting drawn in and getting lost in other people's disputes. So that's another thing that the mediator does. And ultimately, they're trying to get people to reach their own preferred solution to the dispute. So. We work on the assumption that when people um, come up with a solution that they themselves have sculpted, they're more likely to try and make it work. They're more likely to put their shoulder behind it because it's something that they own, that they've come up with jointly, and they're more inclined to sort of attach it to their ego, if you like. So by making the agreement themselves, um, they get a greater incentive to try and make the agreement last beyond just the mediation day, and they try and make it work to resolve their dispute. So the tricky thing is for the mediator to refrain from solution giving themselves. So my own experience in mediation is about 20 years worth. When I started out, 
I was working with the community mediation service, um, in which a lot of the disputes were about noise, and a lot of the noise disputes were about people playing music. Most of them got resolved by somebody either moving the speakers or buying a pair of headphones. So once you've done a few dozen of these disputes, mediated a few dozen of these disputes, you can see that the likely outcome is that somebody's going to buy some headphones. If you tell them to buy headphones, the person will resist and they'll find half a dozen reasons that why that's a bad idea. If they come up with the idea of buying headphones, they'll find half a dozen reasons why it's a good idea. So we assume that um, people prefer to get to their own solutions and then we actively refrain from giving people solutions ourselves. So as mediators, it's not our job to give people the solution, it's our job to help them to come up with it themselves. So the people who are involved, their bit is that they have to agree to participate. The voluntariness is very important because if we frog march people into mediation and have them attend against their will, they are going to block it. They're going to make sure it doesn't work. And I can pretty well guarantee um, that if they decide it's not going to work, then they're right. It's not going to work. There's very little the mediator can do. So we have to be sure that people are agreeing to participate. They have to come along voluntarily. Uh, and as well, they have to abide by some rules and they're expected to be open and honest with each other. So the point of mediation is to have a, a, a very much a heads up, um, open and honest discussion with the other party or parties. And we have to get the explicit commitment from people that this is what they intend to do. So they're going to work by some rules. They're there voluntarily and they're expected to be open and honest with each other. And without those things, it really doesn't work. You can get into situations where People are told they've got to attend, where they refuse to work to rules, and it becomes um, you know, quite a messy process, um, or where, where people just have their heads down and they're not really participating. They're not being honest with each other, um, not being open, and the, it's very difficult to get the conversation going. So there's an expectation on the individuals, which suggests you know we have to have some priming, some warming up, some um, informing and educating people what it's about and what their part in it is. Uh, otherwise, it's really not going to work. Um, and then we go back to um, thinking about where mediation fits in. So mediation then is um, a sort of a voluntary way where we help people to get the negotiation going uh, if they can't negotiate for themselves. Now, quite often we can negotiate dispute resolution for ourselves. Certainly, if I had a problem with my neighbour, um, I'd pick a good time and I'd you know, go and knock the door or chat to them over the garden fence and try and negotiate my way through whatever it was that was going wrong. So if it was anything to do with a parking problem or something to do with the, uh, the boundary between our properties, anything like that, uh, or noise, we try and negotiate, we try and talk it out between ourselves. Um, quite often what happens within housing settings and within universities is that if people are not able to negotiate it for themselves, they will go to whoever is in authority. So in social housing setting, it would be a housing officer. In the university setting, they might speak to somebody in the students' union or they might go to one of the housing managers or residence managers and get them to sort it out. So what I want to do is to show you where exactly medi mediation fits in with those kind of processes of sorting out disputes. So if people could negotiate their way through every dispute, you wouldn't need mediators. So negotiation is the oldest, the quickest, the most successful way of resolving disputes. But when people go to the person in authority, to the housing officer or residence manager or the university, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, the students' union or any other authority at the university, they might get told what to do. So arbitration is another way of solving disputes. If negotiation hasn't worked, parties will go to somebody in authority and will get them to tell them what to do. So the residence manager or the housing officer will say, okay, here's what you've got to do. You need to turn your music down by 11 o'clock. You need to not park your car there. You need to be sensitive to people who are studying within the halls of residence and not disturb them. So they will tell you what to do. And if people don't abide by that, then there might be some sanction or some form of enforcement or in civil cases, actually some court action um, in order to bring about a change in behaviour and make the dispute go away. So we negotiate our way through a lot of disputes just by chatting. We use arbitration, which is where we get someone else to sort it out for us. And ultimately, it might be um, a case of some kind of action or enforcement or sanction in order to um, enforce people to take certain actions. 
Where mediation fits in with this, it fits right in there. So it's a form of getting people to negotiate. It's setting up an environment where people can have a better discussion. It's a way to get people to the table and get them to talk to each other. It's not arbitration, which is where somebody else tells you what to do. And inherently, it's non-binding. So it's a process that's based on good faith. It is based on people's voluntary participation and on their intention to make an agreement work. So we can't enforce anything on people. So that is squarely where mediation fits in as a form of assisted negotiation that falls short of having somebody tell people what to do. OK, probably not any, any big news to some of you out there. And I know some colleagues who are with us this afternoon have already got their own in-house mediators uh, trained by us, which is uh, great that you've come along and joined us again this afternoon. So no massive surprises about mediation. But what I would like to do is just to go a little bit into the mediation process and start to say sort of what we do as mediators, um, the sort of staged process that we use, and then a little bit about why it works. And again, just to remind you, if anybody's got any comments or questions as we go along, you're welcome to type these into the chat box there, and I'll see if I can, um, I can attend to them as we go through. So the mediation process, like I say, some of you familiar with this, some of you not, um, we go through a series of steps and stages. So what we tend to do is to have an initial conversation with one side to the dispute. This is often the person who comes along and is reporting things about their neighbour or flatmate and about their actions. So we will have a conversation with that person. We'll hear about the dispute. We'll decide whether it could be the kind of thing that we could mediate. Um, we'll have a look at any duty of care issues. We'll have a look at any um, issues that may go over the line and need to be investigated or even need to be prosecuted. So there might be situations that we hear about there which are clearly beyond the realms of what can be addressed by mediation and we'd need to have a look at that first. Once we've had, had a look at that uh, and in the throes of that we need to speak to the second person. So with consent from the first one we'll approach the other person and if there are more than two people involved in the dispute then we'll speak to everybody else involved. So we'll approach the other side or sides and get their version of events. These are usually private conversations within the bounds of what would need to be disclosed. We will keep everything um, private. Quite often there are sensitive issues. Quite often there's to do with uh, spoiled relationships or friendships that have gone wrong or things that people have done that they'd rather not be broadcast or shouted from the rooftops. So we keep it private. We don't retain notes. Short of any statutory disclosures, we keep the whole thing confidential. Once you've spoken to both, um, once you've spoken to both of them, then we'll get them together on a mediation day, and we're looking at meeting with them separately to start with. So I would spend hour and a quarter, hour and a half with each person on the morning of a mediation day. Uh, we've had the initial chat with them, or in the case of where we do mediations, we get a case manager to chat with the people uh, prior to the mediation day, and then we meet them separately to start with, actually on the morning of the mediation day. <coughs> then, depending on where we get to with that. We'll either get people together or we'll shut it between them. So in many cases, it's OK to get people in the same room and to start to get the conversation going. Sometimes it's not appropriate to begin that way. In some residences, there may have been physical or verbal aggression between the parties. There may have been threats made. Um, people might be scared. They might just be afraid of their neighbour, which is a fact of life. Um, so we wouldn't be looking to uh, force them into a room together. Uh, we would shuttle, keep them in separate rooms and the mediator actually walk between the two parties as they are in separate rooms um, and start to do the negotiation that way. So on the mediation day, we meet people separately to begin with, often in the morning, and then look at getting them together or shuttling between them during the afternoon. That brings sort of the middle of the process. And the middle of the process really is about allowing people to have a good old offload and have an exchange of views to really describe to the other person you know, how their words and behaviours have been affecting them, how their actions have been affecting them. And we reframe the whole situation to try and come up with a shared resolution. I've got something uh, more to say about reframing in just a second. I'll come back to that one. Then when we've had that good old dialogue, we've had a, an exchange of views, we've had a better conversation. Um, within the rules that we work with, we've allowed people to express their just sort of dissatisfaction or frustration with their neighbour or flatmate. Um, and hopefully by using reframing and using conversation building and consensus building, we've managed to get them to come up with an idea or two about what they're going to do differently. When we've done that, we write an agreement for them or the summary of their 
where they've got to. We don't disclose in any written materials what they've said. The nuts and bolts of the conversation they've had doesn't need to be uh, written down and no verbatim record is kept. But we will uh, write up an agreement or a sum summary which will allow them something to take away. Um, and sometimes if they want to be able to show that to the residence manager or to the housing officer or, or whoever, uh, they've got something that proves they've taken part in mediation and it proves that they and the other person have come up with an agreement that they believe is going to be workable. So that's the sort of process. It's a six or seven stage process. Um, initial chat with the two sides, then meeting them for a more thorough conversation on the morning of the mediation, either shuttling or getting them together, doing the middle bit of the mediation and coming up with an agreement or summary, which we then follow up on. So we would always seek to get back to the parties after about four or five weeks usually to see how they've got on, to see if the agreement's worked, to check that there's no further need for support and to make sure that the original dispute is to a workable level um, resolved and the issues are not bothering them anymore. So that's our process. Second thing to say about how mediation works is really um, about why these things work. So the, the middle bit there was firstly the offloading and an exchange of views between the two parties. The, the point is that we need to know uh, and need to see and hear how the other person's been affected by our, our actions and we want to be able as an individual to tell them how um, you know how you yourself have been affected as well. So exchanging the report about how you've been affected by the other person is a significant part of mediation and the other thing is that you need to sort of defuse the anger and frustration that you've got in a non-damaging way. So we're not scared of arguments. We do allow people to have the argument that they need to have. We do it in a controlled way. We do it in a way that's bound up with some, within some rules. We do it in a way that makes sure that nobody gets persecuted or bullied in the process. And we do it in such a way that we treat both sides equally, give them an equal chance to speak and an equal encouragement to listen. So it, it, it can be heated. It can be um, uh, you know, a, a conflict situation, a well-managed conflict situation. Uh, which does get loud, it does sometimes um, you know, need to be uh, well controlled by the mediator, but in that part of the mediation, um, the important offloading takes place, which gets people ready to be able to think a bit straighter, have an exchange of views and be able to actually come up with something. The mediator's particular technique in that is about the second part here of how mediation works, which is using reframing to help people come up with some kind of a shared resolution. And it's to do with how we deal with conflict psychologically, really. It's to do with how we as individuals tend to approach conflict. What we tend to do is we blame the other guy. So it's our neighbour, it's our flatmates, it's him upstairs, it's her downstairs, it's the one next door. We will say it's all because of them that we are suffering this distress. It's, it's what we do. So blame and fault tend to be attributed. We tend to point the finger at the other person and they tend to point the, tend to point the finger back at us. We tend to get into the history, so in order to justify our own position and justify our own actions especially, uh, we tend to talk about past events. So I'll give you chapter and verse about how 12 years ago my neighbour deliberately left the pram across my front door or how my flatmates in the university residence deliberately keep me awake at night when I'm trying to study or how they deliberately don't do washing up and leave it all over the kitchen. Um, and I'll give you ooh, a, a diary of such events in order to prove that I'm in the right and the other guy's in the wrong. So again, it's down to our need to feel vindicated and need to feel as if we're not the bad guy. So we tend to attribute blame and fault, we finger point, and we tend to give a, an historical account of the dispute that sort of justifies our own position and our own actions. And then we take up positions. So I would, in a, a neighbourhood dispute in social housing, for example, I say, right, that fence has got to go, you're not parking your car there, you're going to turn your music down at 10 o'clock, you're not getting any footballs back if they come over the fence, you're not to have your compost pile leaning up against um, my wall because it's causing damp. So we would tell people what's got to happen. We take up positions which are insistent um, declaratives about what the other person has to do. And these are, these are the positions that we take up. So this is how we tend to make sense of conflict. It's the other guy's fault, they're to blame. Here's the history of the dispute that proves I'm, I'm in the right. And here's what's got to happen. And that's what we do. So as mediators, we, we work hard to reframe um, what people bring along to the mediation session. 
And instead of sticking on blame and fault, instead of sort of getting drawn into their version of reality around it being the other guy's fault and that they're to blame, we're trying to reframe this into a shared responsibility, a contribution that both parties have to make in order to improve the situation. And as a mediator, it's not for me to determine that and say, well, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. I would just keep them focused on the fact that in spite of who they believe is to blame, I don't have any view on that. I don't take sides, but I do know that they have a shared responsibility and they both have to do something different in order to change this situation towards a resolution. The second thing we reframe is instead of talking about, <coughs> instead of talking about the history, um, we're talking about the future actions that could be taken in relation to what's going on between the two parties. <clears throat> now, this can be quite a relief to the parties, especially if they're expecting that the mediator is going to be forming an opinion or expecting that it's about proof, and it's about bringing along my noise diary, it's about bringing along my photos and these days videos on people's smartphones. Um, as a mediator, I'm not that interested in all of that stuff. Um, what they allege about the other party is not for me to test the truth of that. But what it is for me to do is to reframe into the future actions so that they can put their heads together instead of banging them together and collaborate in order to come up with a, a resolution based in the future, nothing to do with the past. And one of my favorite comments as a mediator over the last 20 years or so is, you're not going to agree about what's happened up to this point. And I try and say it at least once a day. And from their positions, which is about saying, you've got to do this, you can't do that, you must do this, you have to do the other. Uh, we're trying to reframe that into interests, which are people's underlying needs. So we use the word interest as a just a bit of a jargon word in mediation to talk about the underlying needs that are represented by the positions. So if somebody is insisting their neighbour turn the music off at 11 or don't do DIY on a Sunday morning, the interest is probably you know, reasonable peace and quiet, being able to get a good night's sleep, um, you know, being able to, if it's in the university setting, being able to study, being able to have the quiet so that we can actually do some work in the evenings. So the underlying interests are the needs that support the position. So whenever somebody is insistent that X happens, we have to look at what the reasons for X have got to be. Why are they insisting that that thing has got to happen? And then we can negotiate on that basis so that both parties get their interests met simultaneously. Um, and again, you know, the impartiality is a really important thing there. It's not up to me to say um, who's right and who's wrong, who's more to blame or less to blame. It's up to the mediator to do the reframing in this way so that we move towards a shared responsibility for some future actions based on satisfying equally both parties' interests. So that's the kind of technical bit, really. That's the, the bit about how mediation works, and that's the middle bit of the staged process that I talked about. So uh, what's good about it? What are the benefits of using mediation for these type of housing and neighbourhood disputes? Well, you know, one of the benefits is it's very quick and it's quite inexpensive. So you have a mediator who has to spend a certain amount of time on the case. Um, we can do structured mediations, which might take place over uh, most of a day we can do more street mediation as well. So certainly within university residences, a lot of the uh, mediators that we've trained uh, would be quite ready to call a meeting in the kitchen of a, of a flat, maybe meet with each of the people first in private, uh, but then get them together. So leaning on the worktop, um, you know, they actually have their negotiation, their, their, their session in which the mediator gets them to negotiate to come up with a resolution for what's going wrong between them. Might be an hour, might be half an hour. Um, but pretty quick process, pretty inexpensive. The main overhead is the time that it takes for the mediator. Sometimes it's beneficial to take people away from their, their, uh, their normal residence to do the mediation. So certainly with social housing settings or private housing settings, uh, we would often get them to come into um, a housing office or get them to come into some community center. Or recently I did a case where they came into a, a higher conference room in a hotel, which they split the cost. Um, and both of the neighbours came along to that mediation in this sort of very neutral space. Uh, they both said it was very beneficial to come away from the property because, you know, it felt like they were on an equal footing when they came into the conference room uh, and away from the environment that was actually upsetting them. So pretty quick, pretty inexpensive. The second thing is about keeping things private. So we know, especially with in social housing with low level antisocial behaviour, with things that are more sensitive or touchy, people don't want these things broadcast or noted or made into some kind of a permanent record. 
Similarly, in university residences, you know, people may have done things either face to face or on social media or uh, gossip or ganging up or some form of cyberbullying, which they don't necessarily want to be broadcast. It doesn't look good. It doesn't reflect well on you. So people prefer to keep things private. We can get people to speak more openly and honestly for keeping things private so that, you know, we're not retaining a record of what gets said and done. So, again, Another benefit is we can keep things private um, and uh, make sure that there aren't any sensitive disclosures. Another benefit, people reaching their own solutions. As I said earlier, you know, we're more inclined to put our shoulder behind a solution um, when we've come up with it ourselves. Um, so helping people to come up with their own solutions um, so that they'll put the shoulder behind it and make it work. Okay. And we assume that that's beneficial to people rather than having them um, get told what to do. We, we, we don't like being told what to do. Um, and I think people who get told, right, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, as soon as the door is closed, the first inclination is to say, well, I'm not doing, what, I'm not doing that thing. How dare they tell me to do that thing? Um, so we tend to resist being told what to do. And again, you know, reaching your own solution means it's more likely to happen. And the other thing with uh, a lot of uh, friends and clients of ours is about the use of in-house mediators. So uh, one of the um, things that mediation lends itself to very well is being uh, delivered by housing officers, residence managers in the university setting, um, students union officers have done it, welfare officers. Um, so you can train in-house mediators and there's a real benefit there because you've got then available a panel of mediators who work usually on a voluntary basis who can attend to disputes as they happen in residences on campus or in the social housing setting or in the private housing setting. So it might be your housing officers, it might be your neighbourhood managers, um, so it could be anybody really. And better that the population of your mediators, the people who you actually train in mediation to deliver this service, they should reflect the identity of your user group as well. So. It can be a great thing in um, housing, which I'll, I'll say something more about in a moment, to actually train tenants as mediators, to work along with staff from the housing association um, and to couple up both uh, tenants and staff to actually go out as pairs of mediators to mediate disputes as they happen. So the in-house setup is really good. And within universities as well, you know, you can imagine training up people who can respond quite quickly to disputes within student residences, in halls or in, in um, private houses. Um, quick response, they know the turf, they speak the language, they understand the sorts of pressures that people are under and the sorts of settings that they are housed in. And it can be a really good way of uh, enculturating, you know, that sort of uh, a mediator who really knows the turf. So those are some of the benefits there. The thing is, is it's quick and expensive. We keep things private, helping people to come up with their own solutions. And, and the way that you can use in-house mediators is a, it's a really good way to provide mediation in these kind of settings. Where it gets used, it tends to be these kind of disputes. So we've got noise, most common one. Um, and housing associations where I go around, pretty well three quarters or more of the disputes are due to noise, often due to the noise from your um, upstairs neighbour. So you can hear them moving around, you can hear the, the noises across the floor, you can hear the children dropping the toys, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so noise tends to be a big part of it. Other noise things are <coughs> doing DIY or car maintenance on a Sunday morning, <coughs> disturbing people that way, putting a washing machine over, on overnight, that's a favourite one. To, um, you know, if you get cheaper electricity overnight, you can set your washing machine to come on at 11 o'clock, uh, which disturbs your neighbour, even though you've gone to bed. Um, Pet issues, pet mess in the gardens, barking pets, pets coming across people's property, parking, a uh, very common one in private housing and social housing. Um, somebody parking across your drive, somebody using that bit of road outside your house that you would rather keep for yourself. Lifestyle clashes might be about times um, that you come and go. It can be about cooking smells. It can come down to cultural issues. It can come down to uh, the ways that some people misuse drugs and alcohol. Um, so lifestyle clashes there, values um, which disputes go quite deep whenever it comes down to uh, values and beliefs. Um, the dispute tends to go to a deeper level than when it's to do with something more mundane about where, like where you park your car. Problems with communal areas, um, again with social housing in residential care, uh, there are communal areas which there, there can be disputes about who leaves the bush chair there, who leaves the skateboard there, who parks their bike there and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, 
And then it's particularly these days, social media abuse, um, cyberbullying, things being posted on um, Instagram and Facebook about often, often, often these days, these things tend to whip up the disputes and make them worse. Uh, and just a low level antisocial behavior as well. So um, the ways people conduct themselves towards their neighbors, which again, there may be cultural issues, there may be issues to do with, with age and background of people, but um, these can lead to allegations of antisocial behavior, many of which can be mediated. So there's clearly a line that you cross when it goes into something more serious, it has to be investigated or, or, investigated or even prosecuted. But um, you know, a lot of these can actually be mediated for. And then the three settings that we tend to work in as a provider of mediation and mediation training is private housing, social housing, and university residences. Uh, just had a question pop up in the chat box. Somebody's asking um, if you can get a copy of the presentation afterwards. Yes, of course you can. So we'll, we'll make sure you get this uh, afterwards. And we'll also put it up on our website in case uh, you've got anybody else that wants to see it. So in these areas of use, just a few quick examples. Sorry, these are a bit wordy. Yes, there's always a lot to say about these kind of disputes. This one was in private housing, <coughs> something we mediated a few years ago. Obviously, I've changed the names of uh, everyone and everything, so nobody could possibly recognize this, um, you know, bearing in mind the confidentiality of this process. So Bluebell Grove, here's a cul-de-sac, and there's these big 10-foot iron gates. Um, and straight behind these gates was the Smith's property. And then if you went through the gates and turned left, it took you to the, uh, the Joneses. Um, the Smiths, who were straight behind the gates, an older couple. Um, the chap works away sometimes. He, he used to go to Ireland. Uh, and the Joneses, whose house um, you would get to by turning left, they've got a teenage daughter. Um, the Smiths like to close the gates. And there's no particular objection to that from the Joneses, except there were issues... Um, particularly when Mr. Smith was away. Mrs. Smith was a bit reluctant to open the gate to anybody during the day. Um, and this is partly what gave rise to the dispute. So the Smiths would and had in the past denied access to the Joneses' visitors. So when the window cleaner came around one day, um, or when they were getting a patio laid one day, um, people were trying to come and go, and the Smiths wouldn't let them through the gate, um, which caused them a real problem. Um, and the Smiths sort of behaved as if the gate was theirs. There were various things were put forward by the Joneses about having a remote uh, lock on the gate, about having an intercom, etc., etc. But uh, by default, Mrs. Smith was refusing to open the gate, um, and this was creating real issues. So there was some shouting and abuse, unfortunately, between the two couples. Um, it started between the uh, the two ladies of the houses, and then the traps got involved as well. Uh, really, really bothered Mrs. Smith, and she kept, became quite ill as a result. Um, they fitted a CCTV, which the Joneses were unhappy because it was pointing into their property and their teenage daughter and her mates were around and they, they felt as if they were being filmed it really gave rise to problems so we did uh, with a bit of persuasion get um, the two couples into mediation so we, we met with the smiths met them privately uh, we met with the jones privately um, we had to do a little bit of shuttling because uh, mrs smith was of a, a quite a sort of nervous disposition and she was very worried that the process was going to be a bit too shouty and aggressive for her. So we had to keep them separately initially and agree some rules and then get them together. They had a very thorough negotiation. They managed to sort of really offload and talk about how things had been upsetting them. There was some miscommunication and misunderstanding from the past that had to be cleared up both ways. And then they put their heads together and came up with a solution for the gate, which did involve a remote locker and some rules, a bit of a charter that they wrote for how they would ensure security, ensure privacy, take down the CCTV, and have a sort of a protocol for what they would do with the gate. So a happy ending. So that was a private housing one. There was another one I'll, I'll mention to you briefly in a social housing setting. This, this one was two flats. There was a, an up flat and a down flat. Uh, upstairs was Gordon and Rita, and downstairs there was a single lady, Mary. The couple had been there a long time. Mary had been there quite recently. And we often hear this in housing disputes where one side of the dispute will say, oh, they've only been here five minutes. We've lived here 18 years. So the others have only just moved in. Like this is, you know, a significant thing to them. The couple upstairs in this case complained, complained of Mary's music being too loud. She liked to go into the yard, um, sit on her sun lounge, put the radio on, um, and they were disturbed by it upstairs. Um, the communal yard did have a shed belonging to uh, Gordon upstairs. Um, and Mary had strung a washing line from the back of the building across to the shed. Um, and the fellow from upstairs was upset about this because he had to dodge her washing as he walked down the patio. So they had some angry words about the noise and about the washing. And then one day, 
he'd gone out in the garden and the washing was right across the patio so he unhooked unpegged some things folded them and left them on the step and she was very unhappy when she got in that he had touched her washing and done anything with it from his point of view he was just moving it out of the way so he didn't have to walk through it and have it you know flapping on his head as he walked past the washing line um, that gave rise to all sorts of allegations and counter allegations where the lady downstairs actually called the police for the fellow upstairs at one point um, so we did manage to get them together again that was in a community center so we thought it better to come away from the residents got them together in a community center uh, met them uh, separately in the morning and then together in the afternoon we did ask Mary if she wanted to bring anybody with her just to even up the numbers but she was quite happy on her own so we had to carefully manage that to make sure the couple didn't take over in a sort of a two to one scenario uh, but that got to a very good place and we followed that up some time afterwards and it was still working so they were you know they, they kept out of any further conflict on that one and the last one I mentioned is about you know university residents this is a, a dispute that we did on a, a university campus um, one that we mediated where there were four students in a flat uh, they had been good friends hence the title um, but the they'd fallen out you know there were allegations were very typical for these kind of residences where Andrea said her food was being taken even some ready meals that she'd got in the fridge seemed to have gone missing the others weren't sure about that they said we haven't seen any ready meals but Andrea was quite insistent so that was a big bone of contention that one uh, Bobby was fed up that people were using his pans and cutlery which was actually a big deal for him because he was lactose intolerant um, couldn't have certain foods in his pans he was unhappy about that uh, he tried to keep his stuff separate but people have been using his stuff and leaving them in a state um, Claire tended to take herself outside the flat to socialize and would often come back in late she'd often been drinking um, and particularly around exam time they were very unhappy because she'd tend to clatter around when she came in um, and the fourth friend in the flat was Dave a uh, hockey team guy um, who would often bring friends back to the flat late at night you know people that he'd either met or chatted up that evening um, would bring them back around the flat so they, they started off as friends with a good understanding but as their it was their um, second year university as that had gone on um, they kind of grown apart a little bit and these habits had developed um, to the point where it had got quite shouty and it was actually the cleaners who had alerted the university to the fact that there was a problem and somebody approached one of the flatmates and they were very glad to be offered this support to come into a group mediation session um, we met them separately and then we got them together as a foursome it was kind of heated um, and we had to have a couple of breaks and we, we needed to enforce the rules quite strongly it was clearly it had gone on for quite a while this dispute and had gone quite deep um, but uh, did manage to get resolved they did manage to stay in the same flat because two of them were threatening to leave initially but they they relented on that and all stayed for the whole year um, they stopped disturbing other residences in the block and stopped drawing in the university's resources to have to keep trying to sort this out for them so got it sorted out for themselves in a process that took less than a day it was probably about four or five hours in total to do that whole process very successful and again followed it up and it was working after some weeks so three examples there one from um, a private housing setting one from social housing and one from university residences so very large part of our work here at UK mediation this is uh, something that we've done a lot over the last 20 years or so um, a few options that we've got we can provide you with mediators we, we, we're very happy to do that and we do do that we can send a mediator along um, here's, here I am I'm going to talk myself out of business I actually think you, you you may be better off training your own mediators so yes we can provide mediators but it seems to work far more effectively if you take up some in-house training for your housing officers or residence managers um, neighborhood officers so if you um, train up your own people you may find it's far more effective uh, works far better um, so you, we can come along and we can train your people for you so you've got your own mediators you don't need us do a one or two day course a four day qualification program I, I don't want this to be a salesy thing we can send you some details of this stuff afterwards but basically we will train your people up and the other great thing is that you can include your own population so in a housing setting it might be your own residents in a university setting it might be students themselves or union officers um, so people who are of a similar age background identity to those who are you whose disputes you're going to be mediating so there's a real sense of buy-in and engagement a real commitment sometimes um, in many places we've worked where the people who are in dispute can see that the mediators 
are either fellow tenants or fellow students or people who get where they're coming from. So real good engagement and buy-in, and this is why I say, you know, it's good if you train up your own people rather than use external mediators. Um, it's something that we are, you know, very keen on, this idea of uh, training the population of mediators to reflect the population of the service users. And something, um, just one of the housing associations that we've worked with um, started a project like this with us a little while ago where we helped them to select who were going to be the trainees. So we selected some tenants and selected some staff to train up. Uh, they've now got a great mediation service going on down at Derwent Living um, where the mediators go out in pairs and where they can manage it. It's a tenant will go out with a member of staff and actually do the mediation in that way as a, as a, a sort of a pair of mediators. Um, and they put their service up for the Tenant Engagement Awards this year. So Derwent Living, and I was with them just recently, that's me with the, the beard and glasses, um, and uh, that's Mitch Elsiebrook from Derwent Living, who's the resident um, involvement manager, tenant involvement manager. So getting his award, regional award for tenant engagement from the TPAS um, organization who rewards uh, tenant participation. So we're off to the national finals quite soon, um, and it's a recognition for you know a great scheme that they've got together with the, our, tra our training and consultancy, I won't say. I don't want to take credit for their great project, but we've provided the expertise for them to be able to get here. And they're off to the national finals now on uh, the Tenant Engagement Awards. Well done to them. Okay, so just an example of where it can really work. Um, I've given you some definitions about mediation. I've given you some ideas about what goes on in the process, some examples of where it can be applied, and then sort of getting back to uh, the important topic about engagement and involvement, and really getting people's commitment by training up your own mediators. Um, in a way that would uh, give good identification and buy-in and commitment from your potential service users. Much keener to use it when they feel as, as if they're being properly heard by somebody who really understands their predicament. And there we have it. That's my presentation for this afternoon. That's our webinar on using mediation in the housing sector. It's a, a subject I'm enthusiastic about. It's something I could talk about for a long time. Um, but uh, we've chosen just to give it about 40, 45 minutes this afternoon. You've got a chat box on your screen. If anybody would like to ask a question now or make a comment, I'm just going to put up our contact screen as well while we do this. So um, take a look on our website for what's going on. Follow us on Twitter. Um, you'll get news about any events that are going on, any training courses, any seminars, talks. I, I, I do quite a lot of talks and presentations about mediation. You know, if there's anything that comes up in your neck of the woods, you'd be uh, very welcome to come along to that. Um, have a look at our Facebook page, um, like us if, you, if you'd be so kind. Um, get in touch with us more conventionally by um, phone numbers there or drop us an email if there's anything you'd like us to follow up on. So those are all the ways of contacting us. We've got your chat boxes open. I'm just going to sort of leave it for a few minutes um, just while we round off for this afternoon in case anybody's got any comments or questions. Um, we will um, write out to everybody following the webinar um, just to follow this up and to uh, give you details of where to find any further information. Um, so I'm just going to pause for a second and just to see if we get any questions. Okay, looks like I've answered everything. Hurrah. So we've, we've uh, a <laughs> couple of comments there. Yeah, somebody else saying, can we get a copy of the slides? Yeah, for sure. We'll, 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 um, we'll do that for you. So we'll let you have the slides afterwards. I'll send that out. So somebody saying, can we get the slides to share with colleagues who couldn't come? Yeah, you're very welcome. We'll leave it on the website as well. We'll send you details of where to find that. Um, but we'll also write out to everybody with the slides afterwards. Okay, it's Friday afternoon. We've uh, done the webinar. It's about the time. I said that I would take. I'll leave the contact screen up there. Thanks ever so much. It's really good attendance this afternoon. It's one of the, the um, uh, you know, very fully attended webinar. It just shows the sort of interest there is in this kind of topic at the moment. Um, so uh, thanks everybody for uh, coming along. Enjoy the weekend, which is uh, promising to be a warm one. I'm Mike Talbot. Uh, thanks very much for your time this afternoon, and goodbye.